I'd like to introduce Dr. John Ross, a composer. Uh, he uh, currently teaches at Pittsburgh State University in the music department. Um, he has a BM from Covenant College, an MM from Florida State University, and a PhD from the University of Iowa. Um, additional work at the Conservatory National Superior de Musique in Lyon, France, and the American Conservatory um, in France. So um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Ross, and I'm pretty excited to hear him. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to the art department for uh, giving me this chance to. Um, say a few words about this uh, interesting um, combination of topics, art and music. And uh, I, I must say, I started out preparing this lecture by asking various people who had already committed to talk, what were they going to talk about? Because I felt like I was, I don't know, I felt like I was a latecomer to the whole uh, uh, symposium. And, uh, and I thought, I don't know, maybe we should try and unify our discussions. And I got various answers from people, all of which were quite diverse. And one of them even said, oh, I, but I had no intention of trying to influence your discussion based on what I was going to say. I said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so um, I can only hope whatever I have to say is uh, helpful, relevant. Um, I'm not going to hope for enlightening, but we'll, we'll see what we get. Um, Anyway, I had originally uh, called my little lecture, What is Art For? What is Music For? And um, my um, approach to this kind of goes, goes like this. Uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I often got into discussions with fellow uh, composers, generally, um, about music. And of course, one of the things that we sometimes talked about was, you know, compositional technique, the craft of, you know, putting music together. Uh, but uh, every now and then, we would try to branch out into, um, you know, a discussion about music in general. And what was music expressing? What was it about? And, uh, you know, this was, um, it was an interesting topic to me because, you know, I wanted to try and get some insight into it. But what I was turned off by was that it always seemed like, Maybe this is peculiar to graduate school, but you always get this little group of people whose purpose seemed to be to come up with negative examples of something. You know, if you try to say something like, well, I think music, uh, you know, is about this, and they say, oh, but what about this speech, which co completely <laughs> negates what you just said. Uh, and uh, I just found it annoying and kind of frustrating because um, there is, of course, a famous example, which I think has already been indirectly alluded to today. <laughs> here, that's okay. No, click here. And the famous example I'm referring to is four minutes and 33 seconds. I'll take about 30 right now. <laughs> Let people sit down. Yeah, there's probably an insufficient number of handouts, but they're, they're floating around. Great. Well, at least it's nice to see so many people here. Yeah, we have one here. Uh, if anybody wants to hand out, there's an extra one, at least if anybody uh, wants to claim it. Okay. There we go. All right, well, in any case, as I was saying about graduate school and uh, you know, engaging in these uh, supposedly enlightening discussions with my colleagues, 
uh, it was I, I just developed a distaste for negative examples. You know, you know, uh, every time you try to say something that was uh, you thought was true in general about the nature of music, someone would come up with an example that would contradict what you were saying. And I might add that there is nothing wrong with that pursuit. Uh, being an insecure graduate student, I might have been miffed about it, but I can at least, as an older person now, appreciate that, yes, you, you cannot uh, deliberately narrow down a topic uh, to fit your own uh, ability to conceive about it. Yeah, there may be examples that contradict what you think, and you've got to live with that, or just go off on your island somewhere and, and deal with it. But in any case, um, what I noticed was that this was how some of these people would express what they knew about music. They would use these negative examples. And um, the most famous, as I just suggested, was a piece called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds by John Cage. And uh, what's uh, um, unique to this piece is that he, uh, he deliberately creates a situation where nearly all the expectations that one would have about the experience of going to a concert are frustrated. And in fact, uh, his uh, point is to um, create a kind of anti-music. He, he creates a situation in which mere sound poses as music. That becomes the object of what you're supposed to listen to, the sounds around you. And even though you're sitting in a concert hall and there's a performer sitting on the stage, seemingly about to play, they don't play. They just sit there. Turn pages. So the pieces in three movements, <laughs> <laughs> and they are collectively they sit there for, of course, four minutes and thirty-three seconds. Um, but uh, what I uh, found um, unsatisfactory about that piece, however daring or profound it might even be, is that for me it failed to shed any light on what music is expressing, or in other words, it uh, I didn't receive any insight into the nature of those very musical experiences that uh, led me to study music in the first place. So a negative example I found was just unhelpful because if I wanted to know something about <clears throat> what music did to me, why I was attracted to it, I wasn't going to learn anything from a negative example. So that's kind of what I wanted to know. I wanted to know what is going on in music. What is it about a specific piece that captures my interest and imagination and my attention? And yes, I, I wanted to learn about the craft of musical composition. I need to know how music was put together. But I also wanted to learn what does, how does music do what it does? And for that matter, what does music do to us exactly? Those are the things that I want to know about. So, I made an assumption, however, after certain discussions with people, that most of us don't know the answers to these questions. People who make music, composers, performers, are generally not interested in answering these questions. Their focus is on the perfection of their craft. They just want to get better at what they're doing. How it all works, leave that up to, uh, I don't know, philosophers, aestheticians, okay? But they just want to be able to play better, compose better, make a living. <laughs> well, I think those are perfectly reasonable uh, uh, points of view. But it's interesting, I think, that, you know, where do you look to find answers to the question of what, or how does music do what it does? And, uh, and what is it exactly that it does? It's kind of like pharmaceuticals. We enjoy the results without understanding how they work. And the best part, Understanding isn't required. <laughs> so yes, I'm suggesting that music is like a drug. No, not really. Um, so those are the big questions. How does music do what it does? And exactly what does it do? Well, uh, in trying to understand this question, I came across um, a philosopher named Suzanne Langer. And for good or ill, uh, she's really the only philosopher that I understand, uh, and mostly that's just from trying and trying and trying to understand it and reading a lot of it. So uh, I'm 
I have not done any exhaustive search, and uh, the best I can do is sort of present you with some of the highlights of her theory, because I, I find it interesting. Maybe, maybe you will, too.